Left to right, we have Douglas Smith from Ontario. Give us a wave, Douglas. And we have Katie Wagner from Maple Ridge, BC. And we have Jessica Barksdale, who is from Vancouver, Washington now, just south of us. So the first reading is from issue 12. It's called uh, The Last of a Thing. And it was a, it was a story that we took, oh, I guess it would be back in the early 2016, um, fell in love with the feeling of it, which was very much uh, Fletcher Pratt and those old school uh, science fiction fantasy stories. Um. So now I'm going to pass the mic over to Doug and uh, he can give you a little taste of this wonderful story. Okay, the last of a thing. I am a fool. I walk this road from the castle of my lord wearing the costume of a fool. My checkerboard tunic rests loosely in my spare frame, above red leggings, my hat dangling its bells above my painted face. Curled toes of my slippers dance through the dust of the road. A warm sun in a sky unmarked by cloud or winged beast speckles the forest shade. The sound of hoofbeats taps me on my shoulder. I turn to see a knight mounted on a white steed. Proud and strong, his horse carries its load with an effortless, effortless air, a tireless extension of its master. Flames of combat look at holes of its eyes. The knight draws rein. His armor radiates a light too bright to gaze on. The dust that clings to me dares not mar that sheen. Tall and erect, he sits with an easy strength. His face is fair with the haughty grace of a god amongst mortals. A hand and silver gauntlet rests on a jeweled sword hilt of a bit of obsidian scabbard etched with runes. His coach lance is an ivory spire threatening the sky itself. Good day, fool. I am Velkar of the White Castle. He greets me with a voice that hints of mountain storms. I know you, good knight. Or speed you in such martial splendor. He looks to the horizon and a light glows in his face. To battle Mordrag called the mighty, the last of the dragons. With his death will I finally purge the land of the evil buried worms. And in this act will I have great glory. I have a vision of a glorious battle and hear the songs that those such as I will sing in years to come. Glory is fitting for a fine night. Still, after you slay Mordrag, for I hold no doubt that you will prevail. What then? What wonders are left to seek? What mighty deeds remain for such as you? Will not some of your glory leave the world with Mordrag? The knight scowls down at me. What is this talk, fool? We measure greatness by the obstacles against which we strive. Remove them, and we diminish our capacity for greatness. You are a fool, he laughs. His horse, too, snorts derision. The last of a thing is something to cherish, I say. Fool, he cries as he gallops away. I walk on. Tattered clouds scar the afternoon sky. A rustle sounds in the trees. A dwarf appears, a huge golden hammer resting on his shoulder. Sunlight sneaks between leaves to startle the gold, blazing it to life. The dwarf's eyes narrow. Dwarf's eyes are narrow. Then he grins and leaps over the wide ditch of the roadside as if it were a crack. He looks up at me with the face the color of earth, and I smell treasures hidden in dark caves. Half my height, he glows with the strength of the ground beneath his broad feet. I know he could lift me with one gnarled hand and toss me as early winter winds toss a leaf. A silver buckle etched with warding runes holds a gold corded belt around his leather jacket. Jeweled rings adorn his hands, changing color with each movement. Oh, fine fool, he cries and slaps me on my arm, almost sending me to the ground. I am Tugro of the Hidden Mountain. Well met we are, well met indeed. Remember the name of Tugro, for you and your like will sing of this day. He drops his hammer to the road with a great thud and the ground trembles. 
Yes, well met, and to where does Tugrow of the Mountain Dwarves journey that will give me cause to sing? Puffing up his chest, he grins at me. Why, to slay the last of the great worms, Mordrag himself, scourge of the night, slayer of dwarves and elves and men alike. And looter of the horde of the hidden mountains, I offer? That too, he says with a shrug. Perhaps the hidden mountains need to be better hidden. He scowls. Do you mock me, fool? I raise my hands. Would I mock one who can crush me in one with one fist? But what of after you defeat the worm? For certain I am that you shall do so. What then? His brow furrows like a line of mountain ridges. What mean you? Who among the sons of the mountain dwarves will fool such as I sing of in years to come? What great deeds shall perform to make your, their names as famous as Tugro's will be? Tugro shifts from one great foot to the other. They will find deeds to do, he says, but a frown remains. Then he smiles again. War! A war against the humans or the elves. That will be their glory. They will do battle, the dwarves of the mountains and the woods against, well, against everyone else. I'll stop there. Do you want me to read from the other one? Um, we're, we're I'm not sure if it's Jen or Mel who's running. We, um, Sorry? We're actually out of time for, for your section now, but that, but that was great. Um, it's okay. Well, let's have you back on another time and uh, read from one of your newer things. Um, Stay around to the end um, in case there are any questions from the audience. And um, thank you. That was I. I loved revisiting that uh, that world. Um, so next up, we have Catherine K T Wagner uh, from Maple Ridge, and her story Cabin Fever came out in the fall issue of Pulp Literature, so it's fairly recent. And uh, I'm going to hand the mic over to you, say a little bit about it, and uh, give us a taste. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Mel and Jen, for hosting this. And I hope everybody who's watching is staying well and safe. Um, I'm going to read from Cabin Fever, and uh, I'll just get going. The breakfast I'd fixed for the dead man three, three days earlier his last meal, congealed in an iron skillet as far to the other side of the hearth as I could push it with my makeshift cane. Maybe if I'd found a way to cover his body, I'd have been able to tolerate the presence of the corpse longer. But Hamish had left me only two blankets, and I needed both to avoid freezing to death. A month earlier, Hamish had introduced himself I stepped off the ship's gangplank. He placed a ring on my finger. I accepted. I had little choice. He'd removed the ring after I became a burden. When he claimed the Hudson's Bay blankets were fair trade, I tried to argue. He wouldn't look me in the eye. He tethered the pack horse to his mount and rode off, promising to send back help. That was five days ago. Spots of cold sunlight shone through gaps around the door and the window shutters, skittering across the corpse's twisted features. The chill muted the stink. My focus narrowed until the black lump protruding from its mouth consumed all my attention. The tongue echoed the darkest parts of the corpse's shirt, whereas in life the whole face had reflected the bright red of the blood. Without that terrible tongue, I might have believed he was napping. I stared and stared and stared. The light turned golden, heralding the approach of night and her demons. The harsh grade of my breath filled the cabin. Occasionally, I remembered to blink. Three days sharing quarters with the block of flesh, and I'd approached the point where I could no longer tolerate its company. With the dark came an obsession a profound worry my arm might swing out, independent of my control, and connect with rotting meat. My unswollen eye refused to close, even though it couldn't see anything. The weather shifted. Banshee screams punctuated the wails of wind writhing through the forest. The fourth morning dawned, the for forest calm again. 
All I knew for certain was I had to do something about the body. I could not face another night in the company of a dead man. The practicalities of moving a mountain of expired trapper didn't escape my notice, but it had to be done. Either that or I'd have to leave the cabin and that meant sure death. The throb in my leg kept time with the pounding in my skull. Levering myself into a standing position, I accidentally leaned against my sp splitted leg. The walls blurred and I rel relived the fall from the pack horse, the terrible pain when I landed. Hamish's look of consternation when he realized I could no longer ride. Of their own volition, my fingers searched the pocket of my sh skirt. They found nothing. Unsure of an effective dose, I'd added all of my remaining laudanum and strychnine to the bean hash right before I'd served it. I hobbled past the body to the door of lashed planks and pushed. Banked snow crunched, resisted, gave way. Sharp white cold rubbed across my face and fingers, stole up my skirts and down my bodice. Jagged frosted peaks lined the horizon. Gray cliffs corralled black forests. Ice powder dusted across the dead man. The crystals reflected the sun, sparkling like a Christmas ornament. Irritated, I thought to kick the body, but instead I reached down, grabbed its shirt, and yanked. The corpse did not budge. I tried again and again and again. For a time, my mind emptied of everything, save the need to have it out of my sight. Fog billowed in front of my face. Icicles dripped from my hair, my eyebrows, my lashes. The dregs of smoke lace tea coated my mouth. The day passed. Pink and gold, the setting sun shone through the cabin door to illuminate messages carved into the log walls. Names, dates, dreams. Read some before the trapper arrived. Tattered, wanted posters fluttered, a reminder of England, unfair accusations, and the charred ruins of my apothecary. I thought of my sister, Anne, as small and smothering as the cabin. She'd suggested I escape on a bride ship. I thought of her relief of seeing me off. I thought of the man who'd claimed me at the docks in Esquimalt, promised I'd be his partner and wife, then abandoned me faster than a lame mount. I thought of the man whose corpse lay at my feet. I never learned his name and his glee in finding a young woman alone at the checkpoint cabin. I stared past the drifts of snow, past the towering conifers, and past the granite cliffs to the darkening sky, then back at the crumbling cabin. I wondered where along the way I might have done something different. I shook myself. No point in dwelling on the past. The only things I could control lay ahead of me. I took a deep breath, braced against the cane, reached down, heaved, slipped, and fell backwards into the snow. The corpse came with me. White filmed eyes stared from an ashen flaccid face. Bile bit the back of my throat and my sight crumbled around the edges. The dead man blocked the cabin door and I'd already tapped the drakes of my strength. Thank you. That is chilling. I just, uh... Oh, it's such a creepy story and such a good story, too. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, what are you working on now? I am working on a novel. I'm, I'm considering myself a writer in residence and taking advantage of the, the isolation to try and, and finish a novel that is set in a ghost town in. Northern Ontario, in Northern BC. Oh, wonderful. Well, this, this ties right in with that, doesn't it? Northern yes. BC seems to be a theme for you. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just bring, I'm gonna bring Doug back for a minute because we do have a question from the audience for Doug. Um, and uh, Jessica Fabricius is asking, Douglas Smith, do you find yourself drawn to any particular genre? You seem to dabble in so many. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. And again, uh, thanks for uh, for having me on. Um, 
if, if you look at my short fiction, I guess I've, I've always used short fiction as sort of a way to experiment in different styles and across genres. Um, and my novels, I have one published novel, which is a fantasy in my Hiroka universe. Um, I'm currently halfway through book three of a urban fantasy trilogy. Um, I haven't tried to uh, market or, or publish any of those yet. My uh, the advice I got from folks like Charles Delant uh, was write all three because um, for sure you're going to be somewhere in book three and say, oh my God, I wish I had done this in book one or book two. Um, so I. I a, he's right. <laughs> I've found that so many times. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to um, very similar uh, comment to use this uh, time of self-isolation to uh, push through and get the get the third book written. So, so far, once I get that done, I'll have four, um, four novels, uh, which I would classify all as urban fantasy. Um, certainly fantastic um, settings in our modern world. Uh, after that, I'm probably going to either write a standalone science fiction novel that's been in my head for a while, uh, sort of a follow on from my um, short story, Memories of the Dead Man, uh, which appeared in On Spec magazine, another great Canadian magazine, or uh, am I going to go back to the Hiroki universe? Nice. All right. Well, we have Jessica Barksdale on deck, so I'm going to swap you guys out for her, uh, and again, stay around for the end uh, in case we have more questions. Jessica, welcome. And, Hi, thank you. Um, so, The Brightness of Things was a story that we fell in love with early on, like, I think Jessica submitted it probably in the first year we were um, uh, running pulp literature. Uh, and we took too long on it, and it got published elsewhere, and then so we had to wait for a while, and then we finally got to print, run it as a reprint uh, in issue 18 in the spring of 2018. Uh, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Jessica, and you can talk a little bit about it and give us a little sample. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. It was exciting to actually uh, blow my hair dry after 23 days um, and put on a scarf. <laughs> I feel I feel almost human again. Uh, this story has had uh, some legs. It has been published twice and then Audible uh, bought it and professionally did it. Uh, so it's it's been moving around um, and I I'm fond of it because there's a there's travel, but to the moon. So Maxine uh, Witshaw has won a lottery uh, to go to the moon. And I thought I'd sort of read a little, little section from the middle of the story. I've arranged everything, Max said, her duffel bag packed and by the front door. You're shitting me, right? Ronnie stood in front of the fireplace. You think you're going to the moon? I am going to the moon, Max said. What about the kids? I told them already, Precise Aeronautics has a live feed they can watch from the computer. There's a kind of Skype thing. I showed Hazel, shit. Ronnie stomped around, pushing one hand through his blonde but graying hair. When they'd met in college, it had shown white. He'd been a Nordic dream god man to Max, Max's flirty gammon fake self image. For a while, it had worked. They crashed the first time, Ronnie shouted. What am I supposed to do if that happens? Shh, Max stood, glossing over the whole topic. Stop it. Yes, they crashed, but not the second time. Things went perfectly. Did you see him up there? Ronnie waved his hand skyward. That moon house? What is that guy thinking, British nut job? That's what he is, God. Yes, that's it. He thinks he's God. Max picked up her duffel bag. The children were in bed. Betsy, the nanny, was coming at six the next morning, just before Ronnie left for work. Max had showed the children her photo online, a middle-aged woman with short gray hair and kind brown eyes. In preparation, Max had posted a detailed schedule for the two weeks she'd be gone, school, classes, and parties. There were meals stacked like flat shinots in the freezer, lasagna, mac and cheese, meatballs, vegetable soup. 
Betsy would have Max's car and sleep in the guest room. Precise was picking up the cost. You're really going to the moon, mommy? John had asked, his blue eyes wide as the earth she would soon be looking down upon. Innocent for now. I am, sweetie. Can I come? By the time John was an adult, people like Forsyth from Aeronautics would be running daily shuttles to the moon and the moon spas, maybe even Mars. After all, NASA had just made it to Pluto. In a few years, Ronnie could golf on the scorched oxygen empty ground under a bubble. Maybe his game would improve. Max put her hand on the doorknob. Outside, a cab was waiting. Look, you know you're only upset that the schedule is rattled. Bottom line, it's a relief, a break, right? Ronnie stilled, watched her, his eyes wide as John's. I'll be back in two weeks, a little less, Max said, opening the door and stepping out onto the porch. The moonlight, no, it was streetlight all around her. Since all the space shuttle incidents and NASA's folding up of manned intermoon and planetary missions, Max hadn't bothered to keep up with the latest developments. Actually, she never really had. But she'd watched the news, seen the rockets go up and the shuttles hurtle down. She'd seen them blow up a couple of times, shards and chunks tumbling toward the earth, black and smoking. The spectators pressing hands against agonized mouths, disbelief and then horror in their eyes. But now things had changed. The shuttle was like a small, powerful jet, beefy and thick, nose and body like a squat but powerful porpoise. Can it actually lift off? A man next to her asked. He'd been on the chartered plane she'd boarded at LAX. Now they were in the California desert, the exact location, the secret. Enough so that it can crash, another man answered. Jack. He held out his hand first to the other man, Mario, and then to Max. They were sitting in a waiting area, bags at their feet, looking out a window at a group of six other people walking down the tarmac past the shining, stubby shuttle toward the building in which they all sat. Max realized she was only one of two women, two among seven, something pinged in her, an alert, a siren, a siren. Max introduced herself, her heart beating in her throat. She was going to the moon with these people, strangers. It was like the first day of school. The door whooshed open, pulling in hot air. From another door, the instructor who had greeted Max initially and two other similarly garbed people, one a woman, came in carrying bags and clipboards. The room filled with noise, the stilted loudness of the first hour of an awkward cocktail party. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Oh, that is wonderful, Jessica. That, that story, I just realized listening to it, it ties in with the story that Laura Coster read last week, the super. It, to me, your story is very similar too. It's about an ordinary woman put in an extraordinary situation, uh, which, is, which is really cool. I, and I think that's what I love so much about this story was how relatable Max is as a character. Um, I do have a question from the audience. Um, uh, can you talk about the difference between Jessica Barksdale and Jessica Inclan and Jessica Barksdale Inclan? Jessica Barksdale Inclan um, was what I first published as, and uh, then my agent decided I should give romance writing a um, a go, and it. Um, so we went out as Jessica Inclan to d differentiate and I did that for I wrote six romances and then I also went through a divorce so I kind of um, reemerged as myself <laughs> which was kind of nice uh, so I, I've been publishing my last um, my poetry collection which came out last year was Jessica Barksdale but I have um, my novels, I've gone back to Jessica Barksdale Inclan just to um, remind my novel readers that I'm there. So, uh, and I, just the Jessica Inclan truly, I think, is, is different uh, genre-wise. Um, I'm seeing a question about the Audible. No, um, the Audible story was done by an, an actor and it was fantastic. 
and it sounds amazing, uh, much better than my own reading. And dated probably, except for now, Moon Shuttles, um, I think I was a little ahead of time, so now people are catching up this idea that you can you can hire a shuttle and go around the Earth and um, Moon, you know, once we get through the pandemic, maybe, you know, who knows if we'll have time for going to the moon. Um, but I think I'm, I, I think it's not dated yet. I think I'm catching up um, to the research. There's a question for you from uh, Jessica Fabricius. Any news during this time for the Golden Years Writer Group? Um, we've had to suspend Golden Years Writers because we meet in person. And we also have our, our membership is fairly much in the high risk areas. So uh, we're, we're, some of us are getting together online and we're sharing resources and that. And hopefully we will be back at it. I, I was hoping for the June reading, but I'm thinking it might be the fall, hopefully. Well, let's keep our fingers crossed. Um, and uh, are you you're not meeting at all by Skype or anything like that? Or? Um, no, I, I I might start thinking about doing some of that as as time goes on. Um, some of our members are not on, um, like they're on email, but that's about it. So we'll see. Well, um, fingers crossed.